Our scripture today is from the 19th chapter of Revelation, verses 1 through 10. After this I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The twenty-four elders and four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne, and they cried, Amen! Hallelujah! Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both small and great. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, Do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Opening the 19th chapter of Revelation may be akin to turning on a television set at the precise moment when a football game has been on and as the picture and the sound come into view, there is wild pandemonium cheering going on. And as you look and hear what is happening, you ask, what is all the shouting about? You need to see a replay of whatever it is that has set the stands into tumult. You might well ask as you open Revelation 19, what's all the shouting about? John, as a divine cameraman with words, has afforded us a view of something on the playing arena of time that is watched in the stands or in the stadium by two different crowds. If you had seen the same play watched by two different audiences entirely, you get a feeling as to the contrast between Revelation 18 and 19. For in both the scripture I've read today from Revelation 19 and in the scripture from Revelation 18, the same activity has occurred on the playing field. Babylon is fallen. What is Babylon? We tried to look at that a little bit last week. Babylon, not only an end-time civilization, but Babylon in the eyes of first century Christians was Rome. Babylon is, is with us in terms of a world spirit today. It's whatever style of life attempts to build life without God. Whatever style of life uses people as things in manipulative and exploitive terms. Whatever style of life that neglects the spiritual and human values to accentuate the material and power values. All of that on the playing field of life comes being crushed under God's judgment. And as the stands of Revelation 18 look on, the crowd is filled with the oi vays, the laments, the merchants and the politicians and the tradesmen, the transportation industry which was built upon the the wealth of Babylon and her violation of godly values and spiritual things. And that society laments when God acts in judgment. But you, in Revelation 19, fill the stands again with a different group. The playing field, the action is still the same, but this time when the action happens, Babylon is falling, the penance come out and the cheers come out and you find at the start of Revelation 19 this great cry, this pandemonium cry which is yet articulate. Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor belong unto the Lord our God. And this is a scene at which we are by faith as believers to place ourselves in, knowing 
that the event is to happen, we already can begin to rejoice in the Spirit. What we really have in Revelation, by the way, I think I can describe it in football terms. In football, they have replays. Wouldn't it be nice if they could have pre-plays? They just have replays. But in Revelation, we have pre-plays. And we see what God is going to do. And knowing that when he describes it, it is going to take place, it can excite our heart to begin to rejoice. I think it also makes us realize that we have a choice as to what multitude we want to be in. The crowd that laments, the fall of the world system, or the crowd that rejoices that God Almighty reigns. Now, Revelation 19, if I were to describe it in terms of my being a part of that ultimate multitude and you being a part of that ultimate multitude, it's like Revelation 19 was given to us so that we have an, an advanced copy of the program. Knowing in effect what the, quote, cheers are going to be, let's get on with learning them. Let's get on with singing them and saying them as we live now. That that which we have spoken now may in that day when we speak it anew be enriched by all the meaning we have put to it in the daily lives which God has called us to. So as we approach the scripture today, we see in the first eight verses four hallelujahs of praise to God. The word hallelujah is a very common word in the vocabulary of Christians. It is Surprisingly, though, not a very common word in the New Testament. In fact, the word hallelujah occurs only four times in the New Testament, and all of those four occurrences occur in the eight verses that I have read this morning. The word is a Hebrew word, which in any language comes across the same, hallelujah or alleluia. From the Hebrew word hallel, meaning praise, and from a shortened form of the Hebrew word for God, Jehovah, praise God. When it is used in Revelation chapter 19, the only occasion it's used in the New Testament, it is used as simply more than a code word or more than a word that, uh, that falls from the lips of uh, believers as though it were vain repetition. And it's very easy, by the way, when you say hallelujah, to park the mind in neutral and just as a kind of uh, automatic nervous system response, say hallelujah. But as the saints in Revelation 19 say hallelujah, there are reasons for each hallelujah that is expressed. As when we come deeper into the worship of God, we realize why it is that there is praise upon our lips and praise upon our hearts. The first hallelujah is a hallelujah of affirmation to God. All of us, I think, like this concept of being affirmed by people. I've just begun to hear that term in recent years. Maybe it was around before then, but to be affirmed is to have something you do which is, or some aspect of the personality that you are, and someone else picks up on it and says, I really appreciate that about you. Like coming to me and saying, I really, I really like the unique way you write left-handed. How beautiful the script is. It's like Arabic. No. <clears throat> Unfortunately, most people do not affirm me in my handwriting. Maybe there are other qualities, hopefully they can affirm, and hopefully qualities in you that can be affirmed. What the saints are doing in this first hallelujah, verses 1 and 2 in Revelation 19, is affirming something about God. To worship God, and the essence of worshiping God, is knowing God, knowing the character of God, knowing that his qualities or his attributes are worthy of praise. If, for example, I were a great surgeon or a champion runner or a mathematical genius, it would be impossible for me not to know it. If I were a champion runner, I would know I was a champion runner because, or I should put that in the subjunctive, I, know, I would know I were a champion runner because every time that I ran through the tape, I, I would be there first. So I'm always champion. I couldn't help but know it. If I were a great surgeon, I would know that too because most people that came off my operating table live thereafter. <laughs> if I were a mathematical genius, I would know that because I could think Einstein's thoughts after him, whereas most people cannot do that. There is, about God, the quality of perfection that in him no good trait is lacking. Is God aware of his perfection? Is he aware of who he is? Oh, by all means, he is. For him not to be aware of who he is, that he is perfect and can be 
totally relied upon would be as unthinkable as to imagine that a champion runner wouldn't know that he was a champion or a surgeon to know that he wasn't a great surgeon. God describes himself as, as perfect and as aware of his perfection. He can neither deteriorate nor can he improve. In the language of the hymn, he is perfect in love, in power, and purity. To affirm God, therefore, in worship is to speak the things which God speaks about himself, to believe the things which God teaches us about himself. It is to render to him praise and confession. So the saints do exactly that. They have discovered the essence and the nature of God. And they affirm him for his salvation, his glory, and his power. First of all, salvation. Because this is how the Lord God comes to us as our Savior. And glory, because that describes him and him alone. To him alone belongs glory. That is, there is no other of his kind. He is sole, alone, unique, God, the one God. And he is powerful. He can accomplish whatever he intends to do. And as we say these words in affirming God, that salvation, glory, and power belongs to him, it awakens in us then certain kinds of responses. When we say salvation to God, our response has to be gratitude because salvation was purchased for us by God in the cross of Jesus. When we say glory to God, it must awaken within us reverence for we bow before such a one. When we say that God is power, then it awakens in us trust. And we recall again that Revelation was written at a time when the power of Caesar was very evident and strong. The power of the world was very strong. And from a natural point of view, it looked like the power of God was so very weak. But saints, when they praise God, trust him for his power. Realizing that when we have committed our life to the Lord... No matter how dire our particular circumstance might be, in fact, the more dire our circumstance, the more the need is at that moment to confess God's power. That he's got us and our problem and our needs within his grips. So I affirm the Lord for his salvation, his glory, and his power. The saints also affirm God for his justice. They say, true and just are his judgments. What is happening to Babylon, the saints agree with. Just as in this day of salvation, God's people agree with him in the salvation of sinners. Everyone rejoices with the angels over someone who comes to Christ. In the coming day of judgment, the saints will agree with God in his judgment of the wicked. Even as they have agreed with him now in his salvation of the lost. Because then we will have a perfect mind to understand and see God's true and righteous judgment that it is he alone who can read the inmost intention of the heart, he alone who can judge without prejudice because he is righteous, he alone who has the wisdom to find truth and to apply the power of judgment. He will judge a society or a person who has built their life without him, who has put their trust in material things or has used evil powers to make an evil existence or has drunk, as did Babylon, the blood of the saints of God. The saints agree with God in his judgment. True and just are his judgments. And they also affirm God for his faithfulness, that he has avenged on her the blood of his servants. That God indeed has, has kept his covenant, that he would judge and that he would be faithful to his own people. The story is told of an old Scottish lady who was dying. And as she was dying, she was laying on her bed, glorying in the assurance of her salvation. A young pastor came by to visit her and listened to her as she spoke with confidence of her soon going to meet the Lord. And he began to raise questions in her as to how she could be so sure, he would say to her, that she really was going to be with the Lord. He was just a little bit nervous at her total confidence in salvation. Her reply to his continued questions went something like this. If I were to awake in eternity to find myself among the lost, the Lord would lose more than I would. For all that I would lose would be my immortal soul, but he would have lost his good name. Hmm. 
It is because He is faithful that we can rejoice and realize He will keep His good name into the ages. So the first hallelujah of Revelation 19 is a hallelujah of affirmation to God. The second hallelujah is for the visible evidence of God's judgment. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. It's a way of saying, a poetic way of saying, that when God has finally acted in judgment, never will he allow anything like Babylon to rise again. That the saints, the people of God, will be with him forever, without the need to again wrestle against principalities and powers and spiritual rulers of wickedness in high places. The third hallelujah of Revelation 19 is a hallelujah of agreement. It comes from the 24 elders and the four living creatures whom we have first seen in Revelation 4. Some have said the 24 elders represent 12 patriarchs and 12 apostles and therefore represent the worshiping church of all ages. Others have said, no, the 24 elders are high angelic beings who are a council about the throne of God. I indicated that I don't think one's life depends upon the particular interpretation of that. I personally prefer the idea of angels. But there are joined by four living creatures who are perhaps representatives of, of forces in nature, personified in living creatures God has created to be about his throne. The first time they've been introduced in Revelation, they are worshiping God. And this is their last appearance in Revelation. They are worshiping God and they are agreeing with all that God has done through saying the word, Amen. And the saints as well are invited to agree with God for his actions. Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both small and great. Are you in agreement with God for his way he's working in your life, the way he's determined to work in the world and his ultimate working? Can you say with the living ones and the 24 elders, Amen, hallelujah, to God. The fourth hallelujah in this passage is a hallelujah of unrestrained joy. It's as though the choir of heaven, consisting of both men and angels, becomes so vast that every redeemed and every created being of God in the universe picks up the sound in verse 6 and breaks out in song. Hallelujah, for the Lord God, the Almighty, reigns. They're singing a song of unrestrained joy because the Lord God Almighty reigns. Two things I want to say about that. One is that the Lord God here is called Almighty. It is a, the particular word that's used for Almighty is a word used only ten times in the New Testament and nine times in the book of Revelation out of the ten. And it's a word which denotes a person who has control of all things, the one who has all things in his grasp or grip, the one whose power guides and directs all things, the Lord God Almighty. And in the early saints being given an advanced program copy of the praise which is to come, there's a deliberate reason for that because, as I've indicated earlier in this message, the early Christians were people who very much lived and under the power of an oppressive political force, even as there are Christians all over the world today who live in the same kinds of conditions. And they are being taught in that midst of oppression to never equate human power as being even equal to God's power. The Lord God Almighty. The English text says, The Lord God Almighty reigns. Present tense, meaning that's the song sung in the future, so of course it's the future and he's reigning. The Greek text says this, The Lord God Almighty reigned. Past tense. Meaning that when the saints begin to sing this song in heaven, it's not a song which says, Oh, at last, God has begun to reign. It's a song which says, all along, God has reigned. We're recognizing it now, but we've recognized it when we were with Him on earth, when we followed Him in the Spirit, when we worshipped Him without the benefit of physically seeing Him face to face, and when we were crushed by the circumstances about us, we yet had this confession, the Lord God Almighty reigned. And that's an incredible way of looking at daily life. And the terrible, violent bumps that, can, that, has, that have happened to some of you that are here this morning, when it looks to you as if God might have abdicated His responsibility to be your Savior and Deliverer and your friend, that confession of faith can be made from the heart because it reflects the 
really true nature of God. The Lord God reigned. And the purpose for giving us this advanced program of worship is to help us begin practicing it now. He reigned. It never occurred to John that God ever lost his grip on the situation. I kiddingly mentioned in a sermon several months ago that I never have liked the phrase, God is still on his throne, because it infers that there might have been a time when the Lord momentarily got off the throne. Still on the throne. Oh, or is he just barely hanging on? No, he is on the throne. That's the message of Revelation and the message of Scripture. Why is there this unrestrained joy? Not only because the Lord God Almighty reigned, but because the wedding has come. Rejoice and be glad. This specific phrase, rejoice and be glad, these two verbs used together, there's only one other time in the New Testament where these two verbs are used together. And it is found in Matthew 5.12 where Jesus pronounces a blessing on those who are persecuted for his name's sake. And he says to the persecuted, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. That is to say, when you suffer for the sake of being identified with Christ, you're to remember the future. And in, and in remembering the future of your reign with the Lord, it should bring you a portion of present moment joy. That joy is not simply something reserved for then. By anticipating then, the joy can be experienced now. The wedding in Revelation chapter 19 now has come. The bride is the church, the people of God. The lamb is Jesus. In biblical days, a marriage involved two major events. Sometimes I think in old days they did things right. Maybe we don't have things quite as precise as they did. We may not be as advanced a culture as the ancients. There were two major events in biblical days attached to a wedding. The betrothal and the wedding itself. These two, the betrothal and the wedding, were separated by a period of time during which the two were considered husband and wife. And we know that if from nothing else in Matthew chapter 1 with the incident of Joseph, at Joseph and Mary who were betrothed yet from a legal standpoint viewed as husband and wife. On the day of the wedding the wedding began with a procession to the bride's house who is ready followed by a return to the groom's house for the marriage feast. Now what an incredible symbol as applied to Revelation 19. The Lord comes for his people who are ready. He comes to the bride's house on the day of the wedding to take her. And she is ready not only because of the righteousness provided by the blood of Christ, but there is an adornment to her character that suggests that, that she, the body, the people of the Lord, have lived righteously as well, clothed in fine linen. And when the Lord has come from his world to enter our world, and gotten his bride, he takes the bride to the groom's house for the wedding feast to celebrate as would be the characteristic with a wedding in biblical days. Now, there may be two ways you can take this. The first coming of Christ involves him, the groom, coming to win his bride in the world, knowing that ultimately those people for whom he came are going to be brought to him forever. There's also the sense in which it reflects the second coming, that the Lord comes for his bride, which is prepared, and takes us to be with him. On the announcement of this news, verses 9 and 10 reflect there is a blessing of invitation being invited to the wedding. Jesus said, People will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus said in Matthew 26 of the communion, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until I the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So the Lord here says, or the angel says, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. The fourth blessing out of seven pronounced in Revelation is here. Blessed are those who are invited. We think back to Revelation 3.20 where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. And when we've opened our life to the Lord, he's come in and he's fellowshiped with us, but he intends also for us to be his guests, he with me. <clears throat> this announcement of news is so ecstatic to John that momentarily he forgets himself and falls down in worship of the angel, suggesting to us that it may be on occasion that true messengers of God can come with an announcement that is so true 
and vital to our lives that we may embrace the messenger more fully than we embrace the God that is being described. It's always possible to worship at the shrine of preachers and angels and conveyors of truth and authors of books and the like to become, instead of a Christian, a someone of another name with an I-A-N on the end and name some name out there, and I better not try starting to name names, to worship something less than God and the true messenger of God will pull people right back up on their feet and say, don't worship me, but worship God. For the true spirit of prophecy is that to which Jesus bears witness and which bears witness to Jesus himself. Just before the first service this morning, one of our families dropped their little two-year-old off at Toddlerland. And as they put their little girl, Alicia, in Toddlerland, she didn't exactly like what was happening. And she set up a pretty significant protest. <laughs> I felt for them as they closed the door as quickly as possible to make their getaway. And it just struck me how, you know, what was going on in that little child's mind at that point. Where were mommy and daddy going? Will they come back? I'm not sure I want to be left here alone. How much that describes when Jesus left his disciples and he entered the open door of heaven and for a while the door was closed. And we are looking around saying, oh, it would be so great if he were here. But if he has gone, he has purposes to accomplish that he must do in our absence. But just as Alicia's parents returned for her at the end of Sunday school this morning, so the children of God know that the Lord returns for his own. And all the cries of wondering where the Lord is or why he isn't immediately here are swallowed up in the announcement, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. It's a personal invitation for you and for me. And it's meant to be responded to by an alleluia in our life as we praise God through affirming Him for who He is by praising Him for His justice, His salvation, His deliverance, by worshiping Him from the depths of our heart. Let's take some moments now to worship the Lord as we prepare for communion. Our gracious Father, we praise you today that you are indeed our gracious Father. The one who accepts us as we are at the foot of the cross and forgives all of our sins and makes us new. Your sheep, Lord, know your voice and they hear your call and your word bears witness that when your sheep have been cut off from the flock and are alone and hungry and hurting, you go after them to seek them. And in every flock of yours that gathers, there are those sheep who are on the perimeter of the flock or who have strayed away, perhaps momentarily, they're back in the flock. And your heart beats for them and is concerned for them as it is for the sheep who are nearest to you. And as Pastor Lord, today I sense some of your concern for that in your flock who are on the edges of the fold, for whom hallelujahs seem to be a very distant thing, for whom the wounds of life seem so very strong, and who have found it very difficult, if not regarded as an impossibility to praise you in the midst of what is going on in their life and about them. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the scripture which tells us to move the future victory into the now. That you will not let us be at all defeated by what comes against us to pick us off. But in our time when strange and bitter winds blow in our life, we will instead come closer into you and huddle with the flock of God. 
and we will dare to lift our voice in faith as did the early Christians in Colosseums and in lion's dens. We will dare to lift our faith and say, The Lord God Almighty reigned. And we will praise you. Even with Job, we will say, Though you slay me, yet will I trust you. We will dare to believe that you are at work. When there are not even any visible evidences around that you are, other than the, the evidence of your nature and character given to us through Christ Jesus. We will trust you because it is in your nature to never fail. It is in your nature never to abandon your own or divorce your people. It is in your nature to catch us in your everlasting arms. And we praise you that we have been invited to you and to such a company as this. Let our worship and our time of communion today be one of gratitude and hallelujah. Through Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen.